Welcome back to my channel. This is Outed, Chapter 22. Mitch. We sat in the waiting room at the Long Ridge Memorial Hospital. Soothing beige walls and the giant aquarium were supposed to make the large room feel homey and comforting, but I didn't buy it. A large angelfish swam around as if it owned the entire aquarium. A small school of tiny fish swam away from it. A little black and white fish hid from all the others, and they all darted away from an eel. Disgusting, boring, soft music played from hidden speakers, and the occasional siren yelped from outside. Nope, this place was not relaxing. Even when I had been behind the doors in the back of the ER, I heard that horrible music. Can music trigger PTSD? I definitely did not have happy memories of this place. Over by the little black and white fish was a small crab with a large claw, and a little fish with googly eyes, and a pretty little fish with, ragged, with a ragged fin. They all kept to themselves, off to the side of the aquarium, while the bullies swam above. It was high school all over again. More not happy memories. Jared held my hand with a grip strong enough to amputate my fingers and looked as pale as me. Do you think you could tighten your grip a little? I said. I still have some feeling in my thumb. Sorry, Jared relaxed his grip. What happened? Mrs. Jackson came over and found her. I was out back working on the yard. She came and got me. I separated my hand from Jared's, stretching out my fingers a little to try and get the feeling back. Lean forward. Let me massage your neck. Jared leaned forward and I began kneading the muscles. I think she was getting up to check on some cookies she was baking, I said. But the chair gave out. The whole side collapsed. She fell and hit her head on the table beside her chair. She was conscious, but no matter what Mrs. Jackson and I tried, we couldn't get her up. I couldn't get the leverage. Not with my arm like this. Who called 911? Jared asked. Me. Her head was bleeding, I said. I didn't know if anything else was wrong, so I called. I tried calling you, but all I got was your answering machine. Headache? How did you guess? I think I'm pro at them by now. I reached up and began a gentle scalp massage, running my fingers through his hair. Jared closed his eyes and took a deep breath. I think I hate this room. Me too, I said. And I only remember the ceiling, and I still have nightmares from the music. It's my second time in a week, and both times someone I loved was behind those doors and all I could do was stare at the fish tank. Rare Jared reached up and rubbed his shoulder muscle. Right here would be nice. I obliged, nodding at the big fish. Those are not nice fish. Look at how they stare at you like you are nothing more than fresh meat. Paranoid much? Jared said. I snickered. No comment. Lean back a little so I can get above your ears. Why does everything happen at the same time? Jared said. God has scheduling issues. Funny, Jared replied. Where's your backpack? You haven't checked, have you? It's in the truck. This seemed more important. Jared sat up. Here's what we're doing. We are going to your truck, getting the backpack going to the cafeteria where you can do your diabetes stuff and we can get some food. I'm starving. I gave him my sexiest look, you know, sultry eyes, pouting mouth. It probably didn't work very well with all the bruises. I love it when you take charge like that. Jared shook his head and almost chuckled. You're getting excited in the middle of the hospital waiting room? Pervert. That's why you love me, I said. You got that right, Jared said. 
but his face became serious as he looked at me. Something was going on in his head, but I guess he wasn't ready to share. Jared. Keep your hat on, I said with only a hint of sarcasm. It looks like a yellow road stripe on top of your head. We were back in the waiting room, sitting by the aquarium, and I had to agree with Mitch. This place had terrible music. Mitch had borrowed a rubber band from the nurse's desk, and I was braiding the hair. I had too many issues lately to get it dyed again, Mitch said. Edna's going to be fine. Don't worry. I finished the braid and wrapped the, the rubber band on the end. This is why I can never move out. I want to do what you and Michaela and Josh are doing, but I've been afraid this would happen for years, and it finally did, and I wasn't there. She couldn't get to her phone, could she? No, Mitch said. She hit the table and everything went flying. I don't even know where her remote is. She had a plate of cookies with her, and the whole rooming, the whole living room has cookies everywhere. I stared at the ceiling, feeling so helpless. I don't know what to do anymore, Mitch. Mitch took my hand. We'll make sure she's okay. Then we'll take care of the cookies. Well, I said, trying to be humorous. Long-range planning. I'm making it up as I go, Mitch said, smiling. A few minutes later, the ER doctor entered and took a seat beside them. Mitch Lassiter? Do I know you, I said. Dr. Anderson, he said. I was the on-call doctor last weekend when you came in. I'm sorry, I said. Last weekend was a blur. Everything happened too fast. I go by Parker now. I'm having it changed as soon as things settle down. That makes sense, Dr. Anderson said. Let me congratulate you on your engagement. Did you know your fiancé refused to leave your side the entire time you were here? Actually, Jared said, a little half-smile playing on his lips. To be more accurate, my fiancé, who shall remain nameless, Mitch, refused to let go of my hand. Congratulations, whatever the reason. Dr. Armstrong leaned forward, elbows on his knees. Let's talk about your mother. How is she? I asked. The primary injury was to her head, upper forehead to be precise. The cut wasn't as deep as yours, Mitch, but head, we head wounds always ble bleed a lot. We glued it back together, and I bet in a couple of months you won't even see a scar. The good news is that the x-rays show no damage to the skull. I want her to check in with her primary care doctor to make sure there are no complications. You said primary injury, I said. Including the head wound, I have four areas of concern. I was sure glad Mitch was there. What else? The more serious news, Dr. Anderson said. We believe she has a minor concussion and we want to keep her here overnight for observation. I spoke with Billing, and since she is covered under both Medicare and Medicaid, her stay is completely paid for. Minor concussion? I was afraid it would be worse, Mitch said, covering my hand with both of his. I told you everything would be all right. The third issue was the damage to her ribs when she fell. X-rays show nothing was broken, but she has bruised more than we expected, enough to make us suspect the fourth problem. We send her blood out to be tested, but we'll know more tomorrow when you pick her up. That doesn't sound good, I said. Her blood sugar was high, wasn't it? Mitch said. It was. Nowhere near as high as yours, but it's high enough to raise concern. We'll know more tomorrow when the full blood work returns. When was the last time she saw her doctor? Years. She never leaves the house. What's wrong? I asked. Blood glucose tests can be done fast and easy. No lab work involved. Mitch stared at his fingers. They must have tested me 15 or 20 times last weekend. More like 10, Dr. Anderson said. You mean mom's diabetic? I asked. We think so, Dr. Armstrong said. We'll know tomorrow. 
She's not going to like that, I muttered. She didn't. She's upstairs right now in one of the beds where I want her to rest tonight. I told you, you I told her you were here, and she's wondering why I didn't send you up an hour ago. Let's go back to Mitch's point of view. You should have seen what they gave me for dinner, and such little portions. Mitch, I don't understand how you can eat crap like that all the time, and they want me to start? Edna crossed her arms and pouted. She wore a bandage on the right temple and a blue hospital gown. And all this fuss over a bump on the head. And did I tell you how much I hate hospitals? They think you have a concussion, Mom, Jared said. And your little bump is the size of a softball. This is insane. Did you know I had cookies in the oven? I've probably burned the house down by now. We'll all be living in Mitch's damn truck. At least it's paid for, I said. Bring your own food, though. I don't have a fridge. I call shotgun, Jared said. Edna snorted and then took Jared's hand. Lord have mercy. We'll take care of the place, Jared said. A good vacuum, I said, and you'll never know the difference. I feel so stupid, Edna said. And now everybody's making a fuss over nothing. Think of it as a vacation, Mom, Jared said. An all-paid trip to a luxury spa. Luxury spa, my butt, Edna said. You two get out of here. Let me be craggy in peace. We'll be back tomorrow to take you home, I said. We drove back to the Java Dai, silently, to pick up Jared's car. Tonight was a cruddy night, but I had spent so much time at the hospital, I only wanted to go home. I want to call it home but I'm scared too. I'm afraid something might happen to take my dream away. On the way back, I drove to the dumps and got in just before they closed. A couple of guys who wanted to go home help unloaded. And then it was back to the Parkers. Jared had arrived before me, but he waited on the steps for me to arrive. He had that Serious look, like he'd been thinking serious thoughts. I wondered if he thought about us. Me. Did he regret what had happened? We walked up to the back door, found it locked, unlocked it, and walked in. The house was dark. No TV blared from the living room. Only the sound of a clock ticking broke the stillness. The oven was off. A pan of cookies rested on top. Mrs. Jackson saved the house. I bent over the tray on the stove and sniffed. The fresh chocolate chip and co coconut oatmeal cookies smelled delicious. Best air freshener in the world. Regular high carb, high sugar, high everything cookies. All for you, buddy. This is weird, Jared said. It's never quiet like this, and she always has the lights on. This will help. I walked into the hall and turned on the lights and the swamp cooler. Better? I'll let you know. Jared walked into the living room and looked at Edna's oversized chair. The right side had collapsed and lay on the floor at a 90 degree angle from the seat. The plaid upholstery had ripped and stuffing pillowed around it. One of the tables had fallen and books and candy and cookies and the remains of a sandwich and the old phone littered the living room. The old push-button phone was off to the side. A bloody towel lay next to the sofa. She was right here in the middle of the floor, I pointed to a spot, bleeding and embarrassed. The EMTs got her on the stretcher, but Mrs. Jackson had to find a couple of neighbors so we could get the stretcher on the ambulance. Think we can save it? Jared knelt by the chair and wiggled the broken side. I wouldn't even know how, I said. Help me get it out back. Maybe we can figure something out. We hefted it to the backyard, but the side hung only by a stretch of fabric. Once out back, in the sunset light, the crushed wood and bent supports were enough evidence to toss the chair into the back of the ugly truck. Now what? Jared asked. Let's go for a walk, I said. I hoped that whatever bothered Jared 
would rear its ugly head in the night air. Just you and me and the sunset. Maybe we can figure us out. Or not. Walking is good. You are a romantic, Jared said. Come on. I pulled Jared's hand and we walked to the road and took a left. As the sun set, the sky turned a brilliant gold and crimson. The street lamps turned on and we made our way to a small park with swings and a playground. Mother and father sat on a bench watching a small boy and a girl chase each other, yelling. A distant truck rumbled on the highway and a few cars drove by. The sun had gone below the horizon, but the sky glowed a brilliant gold. The house seemed so empty tonight. Jared sat on one of the swings and lazily swung. I don't remember a time when Mom wasn't in her chair or in the kitchen. I never realized how much I expected her to always be there, being Mom. It's only for a day. She'll be back tomorrow. I took the swing next to Jared's and lightly pushed off. It's just different, he said. Not a good or bad different, just different. Now's the time when Edna would ask some question or say something deep, I said. Like what? If you can't survive my cooking for one night, I said, you should learn to cook. She'd never say that, Jared said, and pushed off so we swung together. One time I tried to surprise her with pancakes for breakfast, and I burned every single one of them. The eggs I made? More like syrup. She was pretty possessive of the kitchen, I said. Everything had to be in a certain spot. It's times like these, I would go get a beer. Sometimes one beer would make things better. I know how you do math, I said. One beer became two beers, which became four beers, which became a night out. Some girls only look good when you've had four beers, Jared said. Sometimes I wish we could get drunk together. I paused for a good ten seconds before I quietly said, That's one line I'll never cross. I know. I'm sorry about last night. I guess I forgot. Just because I don't drink doesn't stop you from heading out by yourself. I slid off the swing. I'm your friend, not your nanny. There's only one problem. Oh? Jared slid off the swing and stood next to me. No good luck charms. The other ones didn't survive, and I haven't bought any new ones yet. We left the park and headed back to the Parker home. My new home. But I couldn't shake the feeling that bad news was about to come. <laughs>